Hello everyone, uh, this is a podcast episode and I haven't done one of these in a while but uh, something happened in my life recently and I could talk about that in length so here I am with the recorded episode of a podcast. Now, uh, what happened was I met with uh, Dr. Robert per- uh, Buswell um, who is an expert scholar in Korean Buddhism and uh, the conversation left me with a lot of things to uh, think about and reflect on and uh, overall it was just a very pleasant experience and um, I wanted to recap my conversation with him although he is not here with me in person. Um, So to explain why this meeting happened uh, we need to go back in time a little bit because uh, it's just a pure set of coincidences that just happened. I have been practicing Buddhism for uh, about nine months now, so it hasn't even been a year. And I started practicing because of uh, the Buddhist order that I'm most closely associated with right now, uh, Chong Tohe, which is uh, th- they have an American nonprofit called Join Together Society. So it's like uh, Chong To is pure land in Korean, uh, the concept of the pure land in Buddhist lore and the mission of the society is, hey, let's have the pure land in our current society right now without needing to die and become part of the Buddhist legend or whatever, right? So the this Buddhist order ha- is primarily led by the venerable Pumnyun Sinim and I got very addicted to watching all of his Dharma talks on YouTube. And uh, because of that, my interest in Buddhism got ramped up more and more and more because there were a lot of uh, questions and cases where I felt like, hmm, I don't, I'm not sure if I could handle that as a coach. But the sinim, which is the term for monk in Korean, he would always have an answer to everything and that was very strange to see because hmm, i thought monks were all about just you know self-practice and uh, not really you know um doing these kind of individual consults but here this uh monk was basically coaching everybody in domains that i could not uh, coach on and so that got me really deep into the chain of buddhism and uh the the our society the Jongto society, we focus a lot on practicing Buddhism. And um, it, it's as opposed to looking at Buddhism as a philosophy and researching it. It's different from uh, looking at Buddhism as a history and being like a scholar in it. It's different from participating in Buddhism as a religion and going to the temples and then, you know, uh, praying to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to make my life better and make me reincarnate into something better life, right? It's less about all of those but it's more like how do we live like buddha the human being because buddha was a man who attained awakening but he didn't he wasn't just like oh yeah i mean i guess um i know all these things no buddha was able to apply what he awakened into his life he was the man who basically graduated from all suffering and understood it so intricately and deeply and embodied his awakening so that he could pass on the wisdom to others so the whole uh, purpose of my order is to focus less about structure focus less about rigid rules focus less about the you know keeping the historic traditions of buddhism alive but more on the practice part as an individual you can do your part to practice buddhism so the more you get into it, of course, like keeping the lineage and keeping the history and uh, participating in the culture of Buddhism is important, but that all goes on top of the foundation called individual practicing. And so I started my individual practice around November of last year. Okay, so now the that's when I started waking up at, um, at that time it was 6 a.m. And then I woke up, started doing the 108 vows and then the daily meditations. Uh, since then, I have moved uh, to 5 a.m. and then um, the practice, the rest of the practice remains the same. But basically, that's how I've been living my life. Now, because 
I focused a lot on individual practicing, something that was missing from my life was the sense of community. And it's not that uh, community is absolutely important and necessary because I was the living embodiment of just doing the things that I'm doing, right? But I always felt like, hmm, when I was young, we used to go to all these field trips in Korea uh, to these really historic Buddhism sites because Korean Buddhism is actually has a very important place in uh, East Asian Buddhism uh, because the kingdom of the pre 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 Korea of the kingdom of Shilla was a very Buddhist oriented uh, nation and a lot of Buddhist culture and Buddhism knowledge and Buddhism uh, everything just really spawned off from that site and all the relics around Buddhism are all still in Korea and I felt like I was missing out on these things because I was in America and so I was thinking hmm you know I should really visit a temple although I'm individually practicing that doesn't mean that you know I you know I need to necessarily cut away myself from the temple and so I was in, invested in the idea of you know what let's visit a temple let's see what that would be like and which is kind of silly because I live in Los Angeles, the heart of where all the um, Korean people are. Really, we have the biggest Korea town in all the world. But um, so there are uh, temples near me. But for whatever reason, around the time I had this thought, my wife and I were going to visit New York for, uh, purely for leisure. And so I was like, oh, okay, so I'm traveling. So uh, why don't I use this opportunity to just visit a temple? And so I looked for some Korean temples uh, near New York City, and there was one in uh, Upper, we uh, Upper West Side of Manhattan. <clears throat> now that I'm recounting this story, I think I was interested in visiting a temple in New York City because I live in a region called the San Fernando Valley, and this region that I live in is a little bit far from the Korea town where all the temples are. So I think... Um, I wanted to experience a temple that's a little bit outside of my neighborhood first. Well, anyway. So, I visited the Jogesa, the Joge Temple of Korean Buddhism in New York City. And uh, it was a relatively cold day. My wife and I were kind of chilly uh, because we came all the way from California. But... Uh, we found the place on Google Maps. Hey, here it is. And it was a repurposed kind of a New York style apartment, uh, multiple stories. And uh, we didn't really know what to do because I, while I have visited a lot of temples, I've never visited as a Buddhist. So I was just there kind of like awkwardly surround, looking at my surroundings. Where am I? And uh, I was greeted by the head monk there, uh, In Gung Sinim. And... Uh, he was very kind and welcoming. He was like, oh, th oh, thank you for visiting. Oh, how can I help you? And I was like, oh, no, th nothing in particular. I'm just here. I'm um, on traveling and uh, I'm just a Buddhism. Uh, I'm just a Buddhist. I'm a lay, lay believer, I'm not like a monk. I've been practicing for a while and um, I was just hoping to just have a look around and, uh, you, you know, just look around because I've never properly visited a temple as a Buddhist. Um, but the Sinim was like, oh, okay, then you know what? I'm in the middle of cleaning up some stuff right now, but after I clean some stuff up, let's have some tea together. And he invited me for my uh, first tea time. Um, and I learned later on that uh, tea time is how Buddhist people interact and engage with each other. And through the you know art of conversations and stuff i'm being a little emotional right now because um that conversation has changed my life so much in terms of my practice and um i really think that uh, of course the individual practicing part is what was the biggest kind of a big bang for me it started everything but i think this conversation this tea time that i had with uh in gung sinim was the catalyst for all of my future changes that I have encountered. And um, th th during that conversation, we talked about um, what it is like to practice, what it is like to be a Buddhist. And then I, you know, um, I talked to him about how happy my life had become since I started practicing. And um, 
how invested I am in reading all the sutras and um, you know like I'm really trying to uh, live out those values in my life and um, I'm now was just oh, I really left my heart so open because it felt like such a safe space and um, it was super warm uh, the incenses were, were all burning and then it had this familiar Korean feeling right and um, but now I'm here in a Korean temple and while I'm doing largely an individual practice I wanted to understand what did it what it what is it like to do uh, Korean Buddhism uh, because I'm just doing it as an individual and I'm a Korean and I think there is something to learn from Korean Buddhism although I'm not really interested in participating in the religious aspects of it right because um, I, my relationship with Buddhism is not a religious one I don't really care what happens to me when I die I'm not really relying on the bodhisattvas to transport me to like nirvana heaven and then like make me go through other incarnations where I'm better off I'm not interested in any of that so I'm not interested in any of the like relig purely religious ceremonies, but at the same time, um, I want to know more about Korean Buddhism. And so that's where the conversations got really deep. And um, one of the questions I asked was around the topic of uh, Kanhwasan. And this is a distinct, this distinctively Korean Buddhism way of meditating and arriving at an awakening. And it's so, uh, when you look at the Korean Buddhism literature, it's everything or revolves around this topic of Kanhwasan and Hwadu, which I didn't really understand. But the major flaw um, that I thought was, from my understanding, it was something that you have to work with, uh, with a teacher. So basically, like a PhD student or like a you know individual like private tutoring kind of a thing you would have a, a Zen master or Sansa and the Zen master would give you kind of a riddle or like a koan as it's popularly known in the West to contemplate in your mind and then you would just really sit down and contemplate what is this what is this what is this and then suddenly you would come at an uh, awakening but the thing is, I'm an individual practitioner, and I have no uh, teacher to call a teacher. So I was like, hmm, then maybe this would be a good opportunity to ask more about what this practice is. And if the, you know, if the events fold, unfold naturally, then I could maybe ask him to give me like a riddle, like a individually for me, right? But um, the explanation that I got was a little bit cryptic which is very characteristic of Korean Buddhism but at the same time it was very useful he basically gave me the pathway to awakening and uh, I wrote a, uh, in depth about my path to kind of what I call my awakening in my Substack blog uh, but what how the Sunim described it to me at the time goes like this the riddle is just designed to spark a deep feeling of curiosity and doubt. So one of the riddles that's the most popular in beginning a uh, Zen is does a dog have Buddhahood? That's the question and the answer is no. So why is this such a uh, why is this such a good starting point is because it is famously said by the Buddha and uh, Buddhism, you know, like literature in general, that every living being has Buddhahood, that they can awaken. So the question is asking, hey, um, so does that mean like even dogs? And the answer that you're supposed to get when you're awakened is no. Now, this sparks a sense of what the fuck because... This goes directly against what you have learned and what you have known because the answer has to be yes based on your knowledge. But here's this guy who knows or lady, here's this person who knows, knows what's up in a really deep level and they're telling me no. 
So who's right? Like, is Buddha right? Or is my Zen master right? And so this conflict is what gets me into an initial state of like a shock. Because we're so used to kind of riding the wave of, oh, this is how it's supposed to feel. Oh, this is how it's supposed to be. And then you get this nervous system shock of like, wait, what? But the moment goes on and then um, you naturally find yourself distracted and carried over with the next stimulus that comes. So the art of Zen, the art of Sun, is you stay in that feeling of disbelief, wonder, and curiosity, and doubt. And you keep searching inwards. Because the Zen master, he's not going to elaborate. Because the answer is within me. So the answer is within me. So this keeps me thinking, why, why? Is it this? Is it because of this? Oh, maybe. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I think this is what he means, right? And then you go to the Zen master and they will say, no. Why? Because it's not a knowledge thing. It's a lived experience. And so you will get a bonk in your head <laughs> and then you will go back to the meditation room. And you will sit down again. Ah, uh, what is it? And then this feeling, right? It will be kind of like indigestion. And it will make you feel very blocked. But that is if you can sufficiently raise this feeling of doubt. If this isn't really all that important to you, huh, I guess it's like, no, all right. And you just move on. You can't raise these, uh, this feeling of doubt. So... The whole point is how deeply can you identify and sit with your disbelief and doubt to perfectly embody it in your mind so that it becomes a lived experience, this sense of being lost. And the progress looks a little bit now like this. People will dive into themselves, but then they will start hesitating. Sometimes because of external stimulus. Sometimes because of distraction. Sometimes they will lose out the passion to like, ah, why am I even spending time thinking about this? So they will go in and then retreat. In and then retreat. And in and then retreat. Then after a certain point when the doubt has been sufficiently raised, you're going to remove that feeling of hesitation and you're going to be able to deep dive in. And it is at this point where you can just sit down for a prolonged amount of time and just really focus on this feeling and live the experience of what, what's going on. What is this? And it's like a fuse, right? That takes time to burn. And at the end of the fuse, instead of this like big bomb, is like your awakening but you will go down and 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 then you're gonna meet this gate and in front of this gate you're gonna be able to immediately tell this door is like life or death this door will feel like there will be a lot at stake here and you may lose all sense of what it's like to be you, what it's sense, what it's like to be right, what it's like to be wrong. You're just gonna, it, it's gonna very, it's gonna be convincing that you are going to potentially die and lose everything when you open this gate. And at this moment, if you can open the gate, then. You are in. You are in your awakening. So that is the description that I got from uh, In Gung Sinim. And since then, I have kept that to my heart. And I have really, really, really deeply tried to...
to meet those barriers. I've really tried to overcome my hesitations. I've met the door of life and death, and then I opened it with peace. And I did all of that without using Korean Zen. Sun. I did it using the uh, meditation method of Anapana, which is what my Buddhist order uses. So, that aside, the I, I'm from California, and Ingung Sunim is in New York City. And so, we hit off the conversation pretty well, and uh, he was very um, disappointed that I won't be sticking around for a long time and um, you know practicing under him. But he wanted me to have a resource. He wanted me to learn more. He wanted to encourage the flame of passion inside of me. And that is why he recommended me uh, the name called Robert Buswell. Because Dr. Robert Buswell is the expert in Korean Buddhism. In particular, Wonhyo. Wonhyo is the name of a monk in Korea who is the most prominent and re revered figure in all of East Asian Buddhism. And so, he, uh, the Sunim also added that Dr. Robert Buswell spent time in Korea as a monk, so he knows how to practice really well. So if, you, uh, if I study uh, his books, if I study his material, then I'll be able to really accompany uh, the knowledge that I learn with the practice of meditation and so that was the recommendation that I got and uh, a bunch of other books too so if you are um, watching this uh, in the video format these are all the books that uh, the Ingung Sunim has recommended to me and in all these sutras and uh, other things like that, these two are really uh, the important works in understanding Wonhyo's philosophy, and this one is by uh, Dr. Robert Buswell. So, with this information, uh, I purchased all those books immediately, and I found, I googled Dr. Robert Buswell, and I learned that he is, uh, he's retired from UCLA, which is really near me. And so I was like, oh, okay, so he must still be around town. So I found his um, email, and then I emailed him, and this has got to be the most random email, right? Well, I thought it wouldn't be really all that random, because it was my understanding that uh, Ingung Sunim and Dr. Uh, Buswell know each other. But <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> Ingung Sunim knew of uh, Dr. Buswell because of his texts and because of his research, but uh, Dr. Buswell didn't really know about Ingung Sunim. So, but why, what attracted me to talk to Dr. Buswell so much? It's because of this. Wonhyo, the scholar who is so respected in, across all of Asian uh, Buddhism, is my ancestor. <laughs> his last name? was Har, and I am the uh, 63rd generation of Har, and it is my understanding that he's like 18th or something. But anyway, I am a direct <laughs> lineage of Wonhyo. And what are the chances of that, right? So now, Buddhism uh, became a little bit more personal for me. And wow, it's less about, you know, finding the truth and things like that. But it's also... Uh, me reconnecting to my roots and uh, my family name. So with a lot of excitement, I reached out to Dr. Boswell and I was like, hey, I would, um, I got your name and I got your information from a, a monk in New York City and uh, he recommended that I contact you and uh, ask you a lot of questions about uh, practice in particular and such. And so uh, Dr. Boswell was very, very kind enough to uh, give me a lot of uh, books that he had worked on in the past and also uh, initially we met over zoom and um, I asked a bunch of questions around Wonhyo and I just you know was kind of a nerding out <laughs> oh my god um, I saw this book and uh, that you did and then oh my god this was so inspirational to me and then uh, 
But so basically, we had a nice chat over Zoom, and then、uh, we planned on、uh, meeting each other because it was、uh, evident that there were some lo- there were some more things that we wanted to discuss in person. Well, at least I wanted to discuss in person, and.、Uh, The, unfortunately, the timing of this meeting kept on getting delayed and delayed because of my reasons, because of Dr. Buswell's reasons, and then、um, eventually、uh, the stars aligned and we met last Saturday. And、uh, so I he greeted me at the driveway and the gate, and then we entered, and immediately, right? This, this was just so cool.、Um, immediately, the walkway to the house was like a Zen garden, right?、Um, Everything was just like perfectly spaced, and there was like a little stream going, and then、uh, all these rocks, and it, it was just so cool. And、um, he opened the gate,、uh, the, you know, house door, and then you could see that the hallway, right? It was just full of these really majestic and big Buddhist paintings. And、uh, he gave me a tour of all the paintings and the,、um, you know.、Uh, Statues and things like that, and a lot of them had been sourced from Tibet, and so you know how Tibetan、uh, Buddhism art can be very grandiose, with all the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas just kind of sitting in place, and everything so shiny, and、uh, that, that that was such a magnificent sight to behold.、Um, it was kind of like a, it gave me a lot of inspiration about how I want to、uh, have my temple. So if you've been following my.、Uh, Substack or my email, you will know that I have an interest in building my own temple, right? And so that gave that gave the, experiencing Dr. Boswell's house、um, gave me a lot of inspiration about wow. So this is how you can kind of like have a living space that doubles as a temple, and uh, I uh, I presented him my gift、uh, of tea. Again, tea is so important in Buddhism,、um, and、uh, he. Actually, gave me、uh, a tea that、uh, his wife had prepared、uh, for, you know, the family to consume, and、uh, it was a lemon. I don't know what the herb was, but it was a very、uh, delicious kind of a tea. And a quick aside: why tea is so important is because、uh, I learned this from Ingun's name from New York City, and it is that tea is like the perfect embodiment of experience, because I can describe. The flavor of tea. I can describe how it will taste in your mouth, the temperature, the flavor, and the you know scent and everything, and how the cup will be hot and things like that. I can describe all of those things to you, and then they will live inside of you as a knowledge. But the moment you actually take a sip, you realize it is completely different from the experience that is lives inside, living inside of your head, because. It is a lived experience of drinking the tea, so that's why、uh, tea is so important. And we exchanged teas, and then we went to the、uh, courtyard now to exchange、um, some words. And now that was a twenty-eight intro, twenty-eight <laughs> minute intro to the primary topic at hand, and it is about Korean Buddhism. So I learned this.、Uh, In meeting with him, but Dr. Boswell was actually first ordained in Thailand. He was a when he was nineteen, he became a Theravada monk in Thailand, and he used to go into the mountains and、uh, you know practice meditations like all the typical、uh, Theravada people do. So. Why I, I eventually down the line I'm kind of、uh, mixing the time or order of the conversations a little bit. Why? But I asked him. So, doctor, you've been a、uh, you're a Westerner and you've been participating in practicing Buddhism not just as a lay follower. You were ordained and you you practiced as a monk. So w- what drives that kind of a decision process? And he told me. Um, he was always interested in philosophy, so in his ninth grade, he wrote this、uh, large essay about、uh, Schopenhauer and all these uh, prominent uh, philosophy、um, topics and philosophers. And the teacher told him, "This is a really good essay, but this has to be plagiarized because、um, this is way too advanced for your level." So that made a professor at the time laugh because he wrote it, and so he thought, "Huh? If the teacher is..." Uh, claiming this is that this is plagiarized, maybe there's some substance behind it, 
and he uh, dove deeper and deeper into philosophy. And also, one interest that he had in life, especially even at that young and early age, and this was very uh, impactful for me too. In his youth, he asked himself, how can I live without exploiting others? And this is the same kind of a problem that Buddha contemplated in his time of princehood. And so he eventually, uh, you know, as all philosophies do, he eventually discovered Buddhism. And what he really liked about it was it was practical. Whereas continental philosophy is all about head. And then, okay, so I know what Kant thinks. I know what Hegel thinks. I know what Schopenhauer thinks. But now, how does that actually apply to my life? That was largely missing in continental philosophy. But in Buddhism, Eightfold Way and the Five Precepts and things like that, he, it, Buddhism was very practical and he really enjoyed that part. And so that was enough of a, a motivator for him to go to Thailand and be ordained where there's also uh, something to note here. So if you watch my YouTube channel, you will know that uh, at one point around November, I read this book called The Wisdom of Sustainability by Dr. Sulak Sivaraksa. Why this is important is uh, Dr. Sivaraksa is a Thai person, but he is very interested in collectively working with Buddhists of all different types of traditions, right? So although he is primarily a Thai Theravada Buddhist, he always works with a uh, my Buddhist order, Jung Tohe, even when it's not Theravada. And that's how I know of Dr. Sulak Sivaraksa's name. But why that was mentioned in this conversation was because it is also my understanding that the Theravada practitioners typically have a high regard for individual attainment. And there's a lot of pride in really, really, really conservatively applying all of Buddha's teachings into the life of the monk. So they don't cut corners. They do everything as exactly instructed. And there, that is a big source of pride because they didn't adulterate the you know practice with uh, practical reasons or whatever right so i mentioned that with him and um about how theravada monks um seem to have a, a lot of this pride based on what my readings but at the same time there's people like dr sivaraksa who are uh, trying to fuse the network of buddhists across cultures and this is when dr boswell tells me in thailand when you get ordained, your family typically sponsors you, so they purchase and uh, they gift you the uh, clothing that you wear and the wooden uh, bowl that you use to beg for food. So Dr. Boswell didn't have family in Thailand. So guess who sponsored him? Dr. Sivaraksa. <laughs> so it's this, all, all of my Buddhism world and contacts and people figures, they just kind of all fusing into one experience. And this really blew my mind. But anyway, um, the monastic experience in Thailand was good, but Dr. Boswell uh, had a chance to go to Hong Kong. And he from there, he experienced the Chinese Mahayana tradition. So... The Chinese Mahayana is, and uh, the Zen Buddhism is also uh, largely uh, dominant in Chinese Buddhism as well. So they, um, but the difference is Theravada is very much focused on individual meditation and individual attainment of, uh, you know, of the awakening. And uh, it's very also scholastic you spend a lot of time researching the sutras, uh, sometimes memorizing it word by word and then being able to recite it. And when in, in, in that tradition, you also have a senior monk who grades you and evaluates you and then you kind of level up within the Theravada system. Chinese was a little bit different because now um, there is a focus on, again, riddles. But... The monastic experience now is a little bit strange because it used to be in the forest in the Thailand with nobody else. Now it's this semi-social um, space 
but there's not a lot of people. So it's not completely isolated, and at the same time, it's not really completely grouped. And uh, the instruction that they give isn't really around meditation, it's a lot around recital itself. So the uh, senior monk in Hong Kong would just recite a bunch of things to Dr. Boswell and then he would have to just recite them back in order and that's where he learned all, uh, all of his Chinese how to read and speak Chinese and now um, again out of the blue he had a chance to go to Korea where he completely fell in love with Korea why? Uh, it's because that was the most kind of a uh, aligned version of what monastic life would be like in his imagination so it, it's a perfect blend of isolation because korean temples are typically in the mountains in the woods it's typically in a secluded place quick historical fact it is like that because there was a period of time in korean history where um buddhism was heavily disfavored in favor of confucianism so they destroyed and demolished all the temples in the city centers. That's why the remaining temples tend to be in secluded areas. And so he enjoys the foresty kind of like seclusion, but at the same time, Korean monks congregate there. So there's also a sense of community within the monastic order. So it's like a perfect blend of the two. And uh, Dr. Boswell really enjoyed that. And now is where Dr. Buswell's career as an academic kind of starts. The head monk of the Korean temple just had uh, Dr. Buswell do a Zen riddle, which I talked about earlier. And so the Zen riddle that it was presented to him is uh, the, the do, do dogs have Buddhahood? And now, uh, all of the things that I said earlier were repeated back to him. And it seemed that the Korean monks who were uh, fellows of him knew what they were talking about, knew what the head monk was talking about, and they were just in the meditation that they, they were coming out with something. But Dr. Boswell was like, what is this? I have no idea what, wh 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 why. This has nothing to do with Buddhism. And... So as soon as the retreat, uh, meditation retreat for that season was done, he sought out a bunch of texts. And uh, because when you go into meditation retreats, you don't really do anything else, else other than meditation. So it was done. Okay, so now I can finally read the books. So he dove deep into the literature and the history of Korean Buddhism and wanted to understand why are we doing this? Because this is so different. Why are we not reading sutras? Why are we not uh, learning about the text? Why are we not learning and trying to memorize? And why are we not trying to do all of that? It's because Korean Buddhism developed in this way that is independent of scripture. It is independent of academia. Buddhism in Korea was largely propagated at first to the kings and the royals so it was a very high religion but my ancestor Wonhyo he really focused on spreading Buddhism to the masses and so he was the one who brought the more or less pop culture of Buddhism and brought a lot of relief to the suffering of the lay people in uh, olden Korea and so the initial tendency is oh but I don't even know how to read because I'm a low person. I'm not a royal. Does that mean I'm secluded from Buddhism? From the historical Korean uh, Buddhism perspective? No, you don't need any of that. As long as you follow, as long as you come to understanding your true nature, you, as long as you understand that there's something called Buddhahood that you can get to, as long as you understand that there is something to look inwards to in, in terms of awakening, you too can meet Buddha. You too can be awakened. You too can be saved from suffering. That is the largely uh, Korean culture. And that coupled with Jinur Sunim, which is like the uh, 
first in the long lineage of Korean Han Buddhism, he got he was originally studying um the Chinese texts and everything. He was originally you know uh going down the route of academia, but he found that whoa wait, I'm 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 I all these things I was reading and th the more I held on to this kind of curiosity, some. At some point, I just have this explosive kind of an awakening. And he was the first one who kind of experienced this kind of independent from texts, just focusing on the individual feeling and coming to a sudden enlightenment. And uh, so he coined the term Don O Jamsu, which means sudden awakening, consistent practice after you attain the sudden awakening. And so he was the first one who experienced this and his student, the second in the lineage, was the one who systemized it and then passed it down onto the next generations. So this is the core difference between uh, other Zen cultures, uh, Zen Buddhism cultures and Korean one. Chinese ones are also, uh, Chinese Zen is also largely uh, about academia and commenting and researching. and. Japan also. Japan also participates in riddles called koans, but in Japan, there's kind of an answer. So, this is what I learned. Uh, in one book, you have all these riddles. In one book, you have all these answers, but you don't know which answer is applicable to which question. So, your Zen master in Japan will give you, hey, What's uh, I, I give you this question and then the student comes back with this is the answer and then they move on Okay, let's advance to the next puzzle and so on, right? So these are all very dependent on text whereas Korean it's very independent of text relatively because um, In practice It is important to understand the knowledge aspect of it, it is important to widen your horizons because they end up helping you attain the awakening because um, you have more things to kind of try in your mind. Is this it? Oh, wait, it's not. Is this it? Oh, wait, it's not. Is this it? No, it's not. Oh, wait, I'm thinking. Okay, so I need to th put my thinking cap off and then I look within me and then I get new ideas and things like that. So basically, the more knowledge I have inside of me, the more they free float around and then coincidentally form uh, ideas that momentarily gives me hints of like, oh, wait, what the fuck? And then that's how I keep advancing, right? But uh, I think for, from the perspective of Korean Buddhism, uh, if you had to pick one, the text or individual practice, it's largely more focused on individual practice. And... Um, that is the kind of the overall culture of Korean Buddhism. Again, it's for the lay people. It's for it's not uh, just for the royals. It's not just for the rich. It's not just for the powerful. It's a very everyone's kind of a religion. Moreover, the practice of it in terms of meditation is less focused on inner peace, and uh, it's less focused on kind of like transcendental things which you might see from other religions, uh, other variations of Buddhism, but it's more about this whole practice centered around intense doubt, intense curiosity, intense sense of wonder. What? What is this? The awakened person said the answer is this, but why? How did they come to that conclusion? And then the more you wonder, the more you wonder, the more you wonder, the more you wonder, the more time you spend in this deep wonder. At a certain point, you just, it just lands. And again, uh, it's, not a, it's, it's not that there's a specific answer, which is different from the Japanese tradition. It doesn't require you to think of cognitively about the answer. It's about the lived experience of not knowing and feeling deeply bound in that feeling of not knowing and then suddenly coming to an awakening of knowing and while that is the uh practice historically uh 
Buddhism. Sun Buddhism is also a part of, it's a branch, sub branch of the Mahayana Buddhism. So there's a lot of emphasis on the being able to salvage, being able to save the lay person from their individual and uh, ordinary sufferings. So once you attain this wisdom, you don't retreat into the forest and, you know, like keep it to yourself. Then you go out into the world in an engaged way and you meet with the people, you solve their problems. And um, that's how Korean Buddhism definitely goes. And the contextual, because we are a Mahayana tradition, uh, we study the Mahayana Sutras, the uh, Heart Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, the Flower Garland Sutra, the Lotus Sutra, and such. And the another really important book for my personal development was The Awakening of Faith. And uh, that's again a very Mahayana focused book, but uh, how the enlightenment is described in the book is interesting. And uh, this is something one who advocates as well, and it's that you already are awakened it's just that you're deep in the illusion that you are not and so the process of awakening is you coming to terms like oh wait why am i occluding my view oh wait my hands are covering my eye oh oh it's not that i couldn't see it's just that i was doing this without me even knowing and that kind of a original enlightenment original awakening that the coming to understand wait i don't need to be awakened because I, turns out i always was holy fuck that kind of the development is uh again a largely uniquely korean feature of buddhism and we talked a lot about other uh, types of buddhism but something that also struck me interest as interesting is uh the discussions around Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, you may know that the previous episode of this podcast was an interview about uh, Tibetan Buddhism with Dr. Luis. And Tibetan Buddhism is interesting. Some the, the interesting that I learned, interesting things that I learned. Uh, number one, Tibet is really large. I didn't know that it was nearly the size of the United States. I thought, oh, I always thought it was like this small part of China. But uh, after Dr. Boswell was like, no, Tibet is actually really big. It's almost as big as the United States. I was like, wait, whoa. I came home and I looked at the map and it was like, I tried transposing it. It's like, oh, it is almost, that. it's not like as big, but it's nearly that big. So that was really surprising. But at the same time, um, many, the, the Tibetan people are very devout at Buddhist because, uh, this is something I learned yes, uh, and last weekend, the, the people have a very poor uh reception of their history they truly believe that buddhism saved them and so historical accounts of uh tibetans pre-buddhism is all describing uh the themselves as these barbarians like going around rampaging and uh you know like uh being complete shits and things like that but after buddhism that as you recall from the previous episode of this podcast tibetan Bud tibetan uh characters were actually invented in order to transcribe the uh, buddhist sutras and uh, so Buddhism is very a deep part of the Tibetan lifestyle. And so the people all around Tibet, they come to the pilgrimage to, uh, you know, Hasa, Lhasa and uh, the Potala Castle where the His Holiness Dalai Lama resides. And uh, it's kind of like how all the Muslims travel to Mecca at least once in their lifetime. And I, I talked about this in a previous YouTube video, but Tibetan prostration is completely different from Korean prostration. So... Uh, th this also differs a lot in um, across cultures, but Japanese uh, is more focused on zazen, right? Uh, sitting down, kneeling, and the Chinese bowing is they bow and go up, but they do this while kneeling. So when you go to a Chinese temple, which I visited in New York City, they have a knee stand, right? Because they stand, they bow while kneeling, and when you go to a Korean uh, Buddhist temple. They give you mats, they give you cushions because you kneel and then you stand up and you kneel and you stand up to bow. Tibetan, you fully spread. You do a full spread and then you get up. And so uh, all the Tibetan people, when they go on their pilgrimage, they have this um, sliders on their knees and palms to go out and then come back in and go out and come back in. And so 
they carry this wagon of their personal goods and they bow every three steps on the way to uh, in a meeting with the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And that's how serious Tibetan people are about Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, Dr. Boswell said that was actually very moving to see how devout the people were. And, you know, uh, that was very interesting to me too because that's really not an easy thing to do, right? Well, speaking of pilgrimage, I am going to India uh, next year to visit uh, the Buddha's uh, holy sites. And I discussed this with uh, Dr. Boswell as well. And uh, he told me that uh, they tend to be very overwhel uh, that they tend to be very underwhelming and not very well maintained, uh, which I got the sense of after I watched some YouTube videos. And uh, when I got interested in Tibet, I just turned on Google Earth and then I just tried to look at the satellite images of all the places that I'm gonna go and I could really tell that uh, Buddhism in uh, India had really dwindled down and all the maintenance for these holy sites aren't really that great but it's okay uh, it's the experience that counts right and um, yeah that largely uh, sums up the ex uh, conversations around conversa uh, Korean Buddhism I had with Dr. Robert Buswell and uh, for my individual practice I just started uh, to try the Zen meditation uh, Sun meditation around does a dog have uh, Buddhahood? No. Why? And I tried that today and I think I have a it is, I think, a lot easier for me because I broke through the barriers in, with a different kind of a meditation type but I got a sense of what that wonder, what that curiosity, what that uh, deep disbelief is like and how it materializes within my body. It was a very trippy experience. Maybe I'll spend some more time uh, talking about this when I come to a satisfactory uh, phase of uh, practice in Korean Sun meditation. But uh, any Korean temple near you should be able to guide you through the process of Sun. And uh, I plan to also participate in uh, the temple's retreats and things like that when they are available to me in terms of time and location and opportunity. All right. Uh, wow. I did a lot of talking by myself, uh, but this is the podcast episode for Korean Buddhism. Uh, he's not here with me right now, but thank you so much for Dr. Uh, to Dr. Robert Buswell and the man who made it all happen, In Gung Sunim from uh, New York City's Jogesa. And... Uh, to all my Buddhist influences and teachers and all the people I have met thanks to Buddhism, I want to thank you all because you all helped me enrich my life. And my hope is that I can use the power of Buddhism to remove the suffering of more and more people and make the world a happier place. All right, I'll see you in the next podcast episode. Goodbye.